Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Fireside. We're going to get underway very quickly here. But I hope you had some bannock. If you didn't, there's bannock in the, as soon as you enter into the, our museum. Whoever eats the most bannock is going to get 50 bucks from uh, Scott Moe, who's going to mail you a check. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so how many of you have been to Fireside before? Okay, who's never been to Fireside before? Well, welcome. Oh my goodness, welcome. So, you know who our guests are. I'll be introducing them shortly. Um, very soon, I'm going to ask everyone to rise if you can, and they'll make their entrance to, uh, to the stage here. Um, it's part of the history of the office of the Lieutenant Governor uh, office. Um, they'll play, a, when they get up here, we'll play a, the Vice Regal Salute. Um, and then uh, we'll make, I'll make a couple comments again, um, recognizing our sponsor. We have a, I'm gonna ask one of uh, a representative of, our, of Sask Energy to uh, bring some greetings. And of course we wanna recognize uh, Sask Energy for their sponsorship for Fireside. And then uh, we'll start and basically, they're just going to tell their story, like, you know, um, how they grew up and how things came to be and careers they um, ended up having and then ultimately uh, becoming the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan, their honours. And then at any point in time, you're welcome to ask questions. So there's microphones on either side, unless you've got a really loud voice, you can, uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any time. That one there, whoever asks the most questions gets 500 bucks from Scott Moe, okay? So feel free to ask questions. So I'm gonna ask you in a, if, if you could rise for the entrance of his honor, Honorable Russ Morassidy, Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan, and her honor, Donna Morassidy. <laughs> Vice Regal Salute. Be seated. Thank you. So I want to give uh, our representative from Sask Energy, Joe Daniels. You want to come up here, or you want to do? Oh, I'm good down here. You want this? No. You're good. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, good evening. My name is Joseph Daniels. I'm from George Gordon First Nation. Uh, I'm here as the director of Indigenous uh, Engagement for Sask Energy. I'm incredibly uh, grateful for the opportunity to bring greetings on behalf of Sask Energy tonight, as part of our sponsorship with uh, Remy Modern's Fireside with Linden series. The next event uh, featuring two very special guests, the Honorable Russ Morasti, Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan, and our Honour Donna Morasti. Thank you both for being here with us this evening. At Sask Energy, we strive to enhance engagement with uh, local Indigenous groups through collaboration, transparency, and open dialogue. By working together, we can build a strong foundation that ultimately supports the truth and reconciliation calls to uh, action. Sask Energy has committed to supporting the organizations and events such as Fireside with Linden series that help create better understanding of Indigenous culture and bring these stories to life through art, history, and education. And just on a personal note, I don't usually go off script, but uh, I told Linden I was going to do this tonight, but I'm incredibly proud of uh, yourself and Linden. I appreciate you both, and I'm thankful that you guys are both doing your roles and creating space for us to 
have di dialogue and discussion. So thanks, and I'm really proud of him. I've got to spend some time with him over the last couple of years, and I've heard you speak before, uh, Mr. Rasky, and I'm very, very, very proud of you both. And just keep up the good work. On behalf of Saskatchewan, we hope you all enjoy some nice, incredible, important, and informative, uh, informative, sorry, informative discussion. Thank you. Right on, Joel. Right back at you, man. Cool. I have a long introduction here, but I don't want to read it. I'm just gonna. I just want to introduce uh, their honors, uh, Russ Morassity and and her honor, Donna Morassity. And again, uh, like what Fireside's all about, it's an opportunity for the public to to meet these people and just hear their story as uh, people. Uh, we all have a story, all of us, right? We all have a story, and so they're going to just take turns. You'll just take turns. Uh, where'd you grow up? Talk about your family, and and, and we'll, I'll ask questions, jump in a little bit, and, and of course, at any time, too, you're welcome to ask questions as well, and anyone from the audience. So start with you, Your Honor. So just want to start by uh, putting my hand out to each and every one of you, uh, friends and relations, as we would normally say. And we believe that we are all interconnected in some way. And, and so that greeting I've incorporated into my, my office and the work that I do and events that I attend. So it's a very important part of who I am, which I'll get into in a second. But, and then I thank Lyndon for inviting us to be with you here tonight and to tell our story and, and I guess have you ask some questions. So uh, did you have any opening comments? <laughs> so yeah i mean i'll start i guess just uh, go way back and um, the more i say that the more i start to realize that it is going back a ways so i was born in larange i'm a member of the lac larange indian band as is donna uh, through me uh, but she can tell uh, her side of this uh, another story actually that uh, brings us together in a different way and I grew up on a small reserve adjacent to the town of Larange. And I always explain that because my experience coming south to work in southern Saskatchewan really opened my eyes to not only the geography of the province and its vastness across the prairies, but how First Nations were located and generally quite far from neighboring communities. In the north, our communities tend to be adjacent side by side, and that's because of the history of, of the peoples, original peoples, but also the newcomers that came particularly through the fur trade and settled in the same areas. And so uh, Larange itself is comprised of three communities, the Lac Larange Indian Band, the town of Larange, and the village of Arange. And so it's quite, uh, quite different in, in that respect. But I grew up right close to the town of Larange, and literally as you're walking down the road, obviously there you wouldn't notice when you stepped into town because just, especially when I was growing up, the housing was much different uh, and how the community was organized was much different. And so, but once you're in the community, you would see a real mix of people from the First Nation and the town of Larange and Arange. And that's the way it was when I was growing up. And we went to school in the town of Larange because there were no schools on reserve back in those days, at least not at that time. Remembering, and I insert this, that there were two residential schools in Larange. And if you've ever been to Larange, it's situated almost in the, in the center of the town of Larange is the area which is now clear but that both residential schools burnt down and the last one in 1947. And I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. So I grew up in my grandparents' home 
Uh, my father passed when I was very young, so left uh, my mother with me and my brother to raise, but she couldn't do it on her own, so we lived with my grandparents. Small two-room house on the reserve, no running water, no power, and but that was normal for that time period. We didn't think any different, and again, we started to see differences when we went into town, uh, how people lived there with big homes and lights on all the time and all the uh, modern kinds of conveniences that that exist even then and so i walked to school every day from there in kindergarten grade one and then still to this day it's not clear the reason why but i was sent to residential school i say sent because it wasn't we hear lots of stories and in, in the generations before me they were taken but that was kind of evolving or changing. And in the early 60s, many of us and many of my relatives didn't go and some did. Again, the difference there wasn't everybody went. And so from grade two to grade five inclusive, I went to Prince Albert and went to the residential school there. Again, it was a little bit different because that place, as I call it, was not designed to be a school. So in 1947, when the school burnt down in LaRange, housing many, many students from not only the LaRange area, but further north into Stanley Mission, Grandmother's Bay, and other outlying communities, you know, the, the system needed to send children somewhere. And Prince Albert was the closest. Some went to uh, other schools. My mother went, uh, after leaving the school in LaRange when it burnt down, went first to Prince Albert, then because of the numbers they had to send send many of them further on and my mother actually ended up in Gordon's and spent uh, just a year there and then made her way back to LaRange with with other relatives her sisters and a couple of brothers I had an aunt that actually ended up in Manitoba so I described that because even that is a story in and of itself and had an impact on my family before of course I came along and others uh, of my age and recently my mom told me a story of when she was done at Gordon's they loaded them all into a truck and drove them to Prince Albert first in the back of the truck and then to LaRange like hours and hours in the back of a truck and so that's kind of part of where I come from the other part that is still a impactful on me today and even when I think about it I hesitated it uh, because it was so meaningful was being raised by my grandparents who did not speak a word of English so I was very fortunate to be raised in the Cree language and I always describe them as being truly the last generation of my people that lived on the land, truly lived on the land and were connected directly to the land. We as indigenous people today claim to be connected to the land and it is true, we are. That's such a big part of who we are. My grandparents lived it each and every day and they had this small trap line, not luckily for us, I say that because we were able to experience it because of its proximity, about five miles or eight kilometers today, south of LaRange along the old number two highway to Prince Albert. And so we spent a lot of time there. And one cousin in particular who they not legally, but in our own way adopted because his mom couldn't uh, raise him. He actually grew up with them. He went to school, but it was sporadic. And so where I was encouraged to stay in school and which I did. And so that, that life is a big part of who I am. It's a big part of how I look at the world, how I interact with people. And through them, not only did I learn the language, but respect for people, to welcome people into our house and to share what we have, what we had. I saw that on an ongoing basis. And so that was and continues to be when I think about them a huge influence and we're very fortunate our children 
that we're able to meet them. I guess it's they say that because they were just uh, infants, but they remember some some aspects of that that short interaction that they had with my grandparents. And so that the grand the uh, two children that we have uh, and two grandchildren is the extent of our immediate family, but obviously we have much bigger extended family. And so school, I finished school, up ahead here, so I don't wanna go on too, too, too long. Uh, went back to LaRange into grade six through high school. And the one thing I all, always mention, because again, it tells another story about uh, our people and impacts of, of the world around us and how it changed. When I started grade six in LaRange, the classes were very, again, integrated. I use that word because it was a mix versus saying it's a, it was a mixed class. And so many kids from the reserve, many kids from the towns, and we got along. And we played sports together. We uh, obviously went to school together, learned together. And it changed, though. When I went into high school, the numbers were less from, from the reserve. And finally, when I graduated from grade 12, I was the only one. Many reasons for that, whether they were social, economic, or otherwise, many of the kids were still going to the trap line. And that prime period is like early or late fall through the winter into spring when it uh, spring would come along and the trapping season would end so the kids would start school but then it would be interrupted by having to go to the trap line by the time they came back well they were too far behind and eventually many of them didn't continue and so i was fortunate that i was encouraged to stay in school and eventually graduated after Graduation, you know, I, and I step back here because I start to talk about other people that had an influence on me. And in high school, it was the teachers, and one in particular, who encouraged me to consider university. That had never really entered my mind. Sure, as, you know, my class of, of graduates in, through grade 10, 11 talked about what, you know, what we might do. And a couple of the guys said, well, you know, we want to be RCMP officers. One said, I want to be a pilot. Uh, one of the girls said, I want to be a doctor. One said, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. Kind of those kind of common occupations, if you will. I was there wondering, not really knowing what I would do. And we didn't, at home, we didn't have those dinner discussions dinner table discussions is how I describe it, right? Where you sit around the table and talk about, hey, Russ, you know, what are you gonna do after you graduate? Well, that's the first thing would be like, I would be the first one to graduate in my family, even extended family. And so there was no discussion about what's next. The assumption would be, you know, find a job locally and just continue life uh, as everybody knew it. Not that that's a terrible thing. And it wasn't until this teacher started talking to me, kind of one-on-one -on -one saying, you should consider going on to a higher level of education. And uh, so you do well academically. And I was fortunate I did. And uh, so I said, okay. And I went to Saskatoon for a year. Midway through the year, I said, I'm not sure about this. A different world then, you know, I, there probably were other students on campus that were Indigenous, but I didn't know them. I was, I felt isolated. I didn't know anybody. And the example I give that kind of uh, describes how I felt is walking into Psych 101 class, and there were 250 students in this big lecture theater, shaped like this, but much bigger, in the Arts and Science Building at the U of S. And the first time I stepped into that, I wondered if I was even in the right place. And uh, so anyway, worked through part way through the year. And then I decided, oh, you know, maybe I, I need to take a step back. I'll try something else and then maybe come back later on. And 
through a process of elimination, I thought through all the potential career paths, I said, you know, I'm going to try the RCMP. There was a special constable when I was in high school, came to LaRange, who happened to be small world, first cousin of Donna, he was from Cumberland House. And I saw how he interacted with people on the reserve. And I thought, you know, not the typical police officer kind of image. And uh, long story short, I applied. Nine months later, I was in Regina training. The other part of the story that I share, because it speaks to, I guess, uh, who I am, is when I first went to the detachment in Saskatoon, I found it on 8th Street, took the bus as close as I could and into the detachment. I went up to the front desk and this big Mountie comes to the door and his deep voice, I say that, but they all seem to have that image. You know, what can I do for you, young man? I said, well, I'm looking for some information on the application process for the RCMP. He kind of looked at me, I had longish hair, long hair. And, you know, kind of skinny, 160 pounds, if that. And, uh, and he looked at me and I had a bit of a, a skin, pro skin problem. And uh, he says, uh, you need to go look after yourself and maybe come back some other time. And I didn't know what to say. In fact, I was dumbfounded. I turned on my heels and left. And just, yeah, I was in a daze uh, because that wasn't what I expected at all. And so went back to where I was boarding and back to classes about three weeks later. And I'd been thinking about this all every day. And finally, I said to myself, you know, that's, that's unacceptable. You know, that at a minimum, I should have been given a piece of paper or some something that had information on it or a pamphlet. They, and I know they had these nice shiny pamphlets with nice pictures. And, and so, but I said, I wasn't brave enough to go back to the detachment for fear of rejection, I think, I don't know. And so I phoned and a nice lady answered the phone and and immediately she said, well, we have a recruiting officer right here in the building. My first thought was, why didn't that first officer tell me that or just hand me off? So this fellow comes on and starts talking. We have a chat and immediately I can sense a different attitude. And he says, well, you're going to university? Yes, you're indigenous at that time, Aboriginal. At First Nations, I'm a member of the Lac Indian Band. I speak Cree fluently. And he said, you speak Cree? I said, yes. And you're going to university? And a different attitude, but almost questioning that, is this for real? And uh, so I told him the story. He shouldn't have done that. He should have called me. And But he says, can you come in and I'll give you some information? I said, well, I'm busy at class. I was some, some way trying to avoid the place again. And I, it to you and three days later package in the mail with all the information like i said nine months later i was in regina training with 31 other guys i use the term guys i was going to say young men but you know there were six of us that were 19 and today i'd be hard pressed to really describe us as men at that point and uh the oldest being 29, all from all over Canada. There was one other Indigenous cadet. He was from Six Nations in Ontario, and, and we all finished, which was unusual. Usually, you know, two or three will drop off through the six months of training. And so near the end, a couple of weeks from the end, gathered together to, to hear where we're being posted. And so... Uh, we had been told that we wouldn't, in my case, stay in Saskatchewan. I was the only one from Saskatchewan and the others wouldn't be sent back to their home province. It was just a policy the force had so that, you know, you experienced the country. And uh, finally came to me, Constable Morasti. I'm waiting because I'm just really anticipating where, you know, at a minimum we go to Alberta, maybe go near the mountains or somewhere else. and And, Indian head Saskatchewan. I said, what? 
It's only 40 miles from Regina. What kind of adventure is that? In any event, we were all happy to get our postings and you know, drove out 40 miles to Indian Head to, to start my career. But just before I did, all of us were given about a week off to go home, get our whatever together and, and report to our postings. So I went home to La Ronge and my life changed because not only was I embarking on a career with the RCMP, but in that week, I met Donna. And so, really? <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, I went uh, October of 1976 into training, graduated April. And so April 7th, 1977, and that following week I was in La Ronge and that's where we met. And I'm going to hand it off to Donna to get to that point. Oh, Tansy. Oh, gee, I can hear my voice. <laughs> um, it's really nice to be here tonight and to see all of you. And um, so we, so I started my, uh, I should probably go back a little bit. I was born and raised in a northern community called Cumberland House. It's the oldest settlement in, in uh, this part of the world. 1977, 1774, and it, it was established as a community, as a settlement by Samuel Hearn. Next year, I'm putting a plug for my community. They're celebrating 250 years in the summer, I think in July. And um, I was born and raised there, and my parents were Agnes and Pierre Carrier, and I'm number seven out of eight, and uh, I'm the second youngest. I have a younger brother, I had five brothers, and I had two sisters. And uh, when I was growing up, I went to grade one. I didn't speak English. I maybe had a couple words of English when we had to learn how to talk English. And um, so we, I continued on. I, went, I was in school in Cumberland till I was in grade nine. And at that time, we didn't have any high school past grade. We didn't have a high school there. So grade 10, 11, and 12, we had to leave home. And when I'm saying that, I'm number seven. So you can imagine six of my siblings had already left. And my oldest sister is, was 15 years older than me. And she left when she was in to go to grade nine. And I always jokingly said to her, when I was born, you were kicked out. But really, no, she had to go to school because my parents were very adamant that we had to have an education we had to make a life for ourselves and that's what we had to do we had to leave home and um so i went to prince albert my sister-in-law and my brother said you come and live with us for grade 10 and uh, so i went off to prince albert for one year and they moved back to cumberland house so I, I went to Nipwin for 11 and 12. And um, I stayed with people. I never, we had to board. That's another thing we had to do. With, they found us a place to stay with the family. And uh, so that's what I, I met. I stayed in two different places with people I never met before until I came with my with my little suitcase and uh, started school. So I finished m my high school there. And then it was time for me to take something. And my sister-in-law had talked to me when I was in grade 10. And she said, Donna, what are you going to do? And so did my parents, because 
I had other siblings that had gone on and did different things. And like my dad talked about pension. Yeah, you have to have a pension and you have to have a, a, some kind of trade or go and um, make a living for yourself. Even though I was a girl, I was still expected to leave home and get something, get some sort of work. So that's what I, I went off. To. I came here to uh, take an LPN course. Well, we're LPNs now, but at the time we were certified nursing assistants and it was only a 10 month course. Previously, this my sister Verna had, had taken the same course. About, she was six years older than me. So I knew what kind of work it was going to be working in the hospitals or working in nursing homes. So that's what I did. I was able to complete that. And then my I started applying for work and I ended up my first job was LaRange. But before I I went I went home just for a couple of weeks before my starting my job and my cousin's husband had come had come for a visit with his little Cessna and my mother was really great in finding us rides because Cumberland House was semi-isolated in different times when the river I forgot Cumberland House is on the Cumberland Delta so there's water there's you know rivers and so we had to sometimes wait for the ice to go off or or the ice to be thicker so we can go across the river so this time you know it's being april it was it wasn't very good to be going across so my mom got, gave me a got me a ride with my cousin's husband george and that was how I got to LaRange in this little plane with George and uh, started work there. And I met Russ through friends. And uh, a year later, we got married and went on another adventure. Were there any uh, bouquets of flowers or candies involved? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this is April. You know? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, Remy Modern um, has a collection of photographs. We have a one of those photographs with us this evening here. Where's my buddy Kyle? Is Kyle around? He's he's in there, Kyle. Press the magic button. We got a magic button here. Anyways, um, hopefully it'll it'll uh, reveal itself soon enough here. But uh, check that out. Does that does that look familiar to anybody? <laughs> so there is an artist who did uh, photographs of nurses in uh, Loon Lake. And uh, I think there's 10 different photographs. And uh, that's you in there, 1983, I think. Yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that being taken? Yes, I did. And I was pregnant with uh, my son, Matthew. Cool. And it was, uh, there's only, um, it was a small hospital and I worked with an RN and sometimes there were just the two of us at night working and uh, yeah. According was... to the information I have, um, the one who took that picture asked all the nurses to think about a, a patient, think about a certain patient. Do you remember the patient you were think thinking about at the time by any chance? Um, 
yeah. I, I looked after this really wonderful lady when I was in training and she was blind and she was from my home community and I would go talk to her in Cree. And that's who I was thinking of. Cool, whatever, cool. How many of you know about the Cree people here? So in our province, there's actually three kinds of Cree. There's Plains Cree, Woodland Cree, and Swampy Cree. And they all talk Cree, but a little bit differently. So I happen to be Plains Cree, and Russ is uh, Woodland Cree, and Don is a uh, Swampy Cree. And the guy in the front row, he's a Walmart Cree. <laughs> That's my cousin in front there. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, can you, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions, anybody, at any time. Um, can you talk a little bit about how how did you become Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan? Can you share some stories about things you've uh, experienced in that role? And I understand you, you'll be uh, completing the role in April. That'll be three years already? June. Oh, my goodness. That's three. a three-year appointment. Five-year appointment. Okay. Why did it go by fast? Yeah, I guess to set the stage just very quickly, um, because it really, I think, is part of why I'm in this role today. And Donna, even more recently, as we're driving, we put a lot of miles on. We've sat there, or we're home in La Ronge, that's where our main home is. We'll ask the question with, uh, to each other, but uh, sometimes with our other family members, how, how is it that we got here, right? And so we've kind of set the stage in terms of the personal side. I mean, much deeper, there's a lot more that we could talk about, but, uh, you know, we're limited on time. So when I joined the RCMP, then met Donna, we got married, and we spent some time here in Saskatchewan in different detachments and, and also hospitals for Donna. Both our kids were born here just by luck, our daughter Jen in Rostern, and then our son Matthew in I was going to say Loon Lake, but actually was born in North Battleford. And so after a few years here, we left the province and lived in seven provinces in total. And different duties. Uh, I was a dog handler at one point. Uh, the best job in the world, most fun. And people ask, you know, what was your best job in the RCMP? It wasn't the best job, but it was certainly the most fun. And so right from Newfoundland, Gander, Newfoundland, to Prince George, BC, to Alberta, to Manitoba. And then after finishing that kind of work, then back to Saskatchewan, and then to uh, Prince Edward Island, back to Saskatchewan, then to Ottawa. And then I finished as the head of the RCMP, or what's known as a commanding officer for the RCMP here in Saskatchewan, with the rank of assistant commissioner. So I add that to, to my personal story because when I think about, you know, becoming Lieutenant Governor, all of that experience was considered. Now, I'm assuming, and some people that are, weren't directly involved in the process, but kind of on the sidelines have told me that's, that's why you were considered. Between the RCMP and being appointed, there was about a five, six year period where I worked on several initiatives and work with the provincial government. And most of that just by happenstance was in the field of education. Uh, tremendous experience for me, just something that uh, I really enjoyed because it was so different from the work that I'd done for 36 years is how long I spent in the force. And of course, Donna was with me all that time. And, and I've said it before publicly and I'll say it here, like. I wouldn't be here in this chair as Lieutenant Governor if not for Donna's support all those years. It just, there's no way. Because my job took me, even when we were hosted in certain communities, I traveled a, lot, a great deal. And many times she was alone with the kids and trying to pursue her career, which was a challenge given the different requirements for each of the provinces that we lived in. And so, 
Yeah, I mean, without Donna's support and encouragement, and I'll say that because there was a couple of post things I thought, geez, do we really want to go that far like Newfoundland or uh, Prince George, BC, Northern BC? And, and she said, no, no, let's go, let's go. She never once hesitated uh, as far as encouraging me or saying we should we should go. And so uh, that's a very short summary of my career, but uh, did you want to add anything as far as the nursing challenges or? Yeah. No? Okay. Uh, I'm somewhat interested in, because you were talking to me the same age, you were cut off early. Um, I went through a lot of the things you went through in the run. But is it that you would become an RCMP officer from living in the run? Is it a little off balance for me? Do they think that you would be something for that? Would you think for yourself they would be for that? Or is it with me and everybody's going to be up in here right here ready for hours and help me along most of the way? What were the pros and cons of you deciding to do that, both from the Indigenous and, and then the white people that were running the system that you worked in? It seems like it would have been pretty interesting and maybe some kind of slide in your mind, but it's... You know, it's... Uh... It was all positive. I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, there isn't one instance in my home community where somebody then or even as I progressed through the force uh, asked me why I would do such a thing. I was asked that on a number of occasions, not many uh, from other Indigenous people and in communities that I worked at. Why would you work for, for the police? that do such terrible things to our people. But I always felt strongly about the idea of us as individuals, if we want to not necessarily create change, massive change, but contribute to change in a more positive way, that we have to be willing to step in those, into those difficult places. So that was my attitude from quite... Uh, quite far back. As far as my home community, the story, I, I don't tell it very often, but when I'd go home early in my service to LaRange to visit my grandparents, and we'd be sitting there visiting in their home, and people would come in. And that, that's just the way it was. There was no knocking on the door. There's no like setting up a time to have tea. It was just somebody would come in and they'd be welcomed in to have a cup of tea or a meal if if there was something available. I always remember my grandmother on a number of occasions would say, you know, the individual will come in, maybe not necessarily recognize me and introduce me. And and her exact words were, This is my grandchild who is a police officer and very proud of it. And so regardless of after that, Anybody said anything negative about me in the career? I always remember her because she was so proud and expressed it in that way. And so uh, that's not to say that, as I said, in other communities, I would uh, I was challenged, and uh, in non-Indigenous communities, even within the RCMP, I'd hear racist remarks, not directed at me, but at ind Indigenous people more broadly. And uh, and I would respond if I'd heard it, but never in a confrontational way. It was it's never been my approach, and uh, so I did experience that. But I got to say, on a balance, it it was very positive. Yeah. Oh, thank you. How you uh, reconciled maybe what your aim with your career was or what you were trying to do working within that system. Like I work in nonprofit and there's a lot of politics often involved in achieving the things we want to achieve and it can be very frustrating. And I wonder when you were speaking, um, yeah, if you, when you went into the RCMP, if you had a goal in mind in terms of where you came from or 
I don't know if that makes sense, but how you reconciled, I guess, hearing those, hearing things, witnessing things with what you were trying to achieve in your career and how you sort of kept going in the day to day. If maybe there was like a bigger sort of picture that you were looking at. Yeah, well, remembering that I was 19 years old and I didn't have any kind of noble goal in terms of changing the world, right? I mean, some people will say that, right? Well, I joined the police service because I want to help my community and, and in a positive way. I, and I'm very, being very honest with you. It was, at that time, it was a job. And it wasn't until I got working with other members of the force and the organization more generally that I started to realize what I described earlier, you know, some difficult things happening, comments being made. And I think about that. And the one thing that really, uh, I guess, goes back into school days that came to the surface then was that, and I guess it, it's in a way describes as well or reinforces why I stayed in school and graduated was two things. One is at some point, through high school, I had this kind of epiphany, if you will, that that I can do whatever these other people are doing, right? And when I say other people, I'm talking about non-Indigenous people within the system, within the school system. And so that kind of sat in my mind. Even when I entered the force, I thought, I can do the job just as well as this person and maybe even better. And in the context of indigenous people and stereotypes and racist comments and remarks, I always thought I'm going to prove them wrong, right? Not by standing on a pulpit and saying, you know, I'm as good as you and anybody else, but through my actions and how I did my work. And again, when I think back about it, it you know, the support I, I got from my colleagues was tremendous. And not that anybody would say, well, you're different. You're not, you know, like those others that aren't working or they're drinking every day. Nobody ever said that to me directly. But I did get the positive remarks in terms of how I was doing and how I was progressing. And I guess the career uh, proves that, right? I didn't aspire to become the head of the RCMP in Saskatchewan. It was, I always applied myself. I worked hard at every position that I was presented with. And I was motivated by those two things that I could do the job as well as anybody that was recognized. And even as a senior officer in the RCMP, once in a while, I think I've proven to the rest of this organization that I'm not the stereotype that you might think. I'm not saying that they did think of me as, as uh, anybody other than Russ, you know, and it, yeah, they knew I was an indigenous person, but, but uh, it was that, that confidence that I could do the job as well as anybody and ultimately re rewarded for that. And so as I progressed in the senior ranks, uh, people would come to me for advice. So that's, that's how it shifts, right? You know, in the, as a younger RCMP member, uh, not a lot of experience, but working hard, you were just one of the guys. You just did the work. Although, having said that, when I was posted at Rostron, which looked after Beardies and, and One Arrow and Pelican Arrows, I was able to use my language, right? And people would often, members, my colleagues would often come to me and say, Russ, can you come with me? Because I, don't, I think this person may not be able to speak English, not so much in the South, but more in, in Pelican Arrows. And so there was certainly an advantage to having, you know, the, the language skills and sharing those and being able to use them on the job. But it wasn't until later on to, I guess, to answer your question about, you know, any kind of goal. It was more that about uh, the 
I'm trying to frame this the right way, but the idea that that was always in my mind or the reality of working with other people, no matter where you were, who they were, you're, you're not going to be able to do your job as well as, uh, as well as you'd like to if you don't develop strong relationships with people. And you can't have strong relationships with people if you put up barriers and or or aren't willing to learn about those people or those communities that you may be working with and so i reinforced that with my uh, colleagues and with people that i supervised as time went on and and right to uh, being the head of the rcmp in saskatchewan when i spoke to the members throughout the province it was about that about developing strong relationships about willingness to work with with all communities and all peoples to find those solutions for you know the many difficult challenges that still exist today and so i guess over time my thinking changed to being um, somebody that could because of my senior rank influence change right and influence attitudes or change attitudes and so uh, yeah it wasn't an instantaneous kind of thing it was kind of an evolution on a very personal and professional level to get to that point did you ever see the guy again who rejected you <laughs> i did when i first joined but uh, again it, it was one of those situations where no i'm going to do the job uh, as best i can and whether he accepts it or not that's his problem not mine right meet yes that jump ahead to the uh, role of the lg so uh, i'll answer the question first and i'll back up yeah. when a person's appointed to the lieutenant governor position the plan usually is that you would go to London and meet uh, that time the Queen in the first year. It makes sense, right? Because technically we are the uh, Crown's representative here in the province for each province that has a lieutenant governor. Every province does. And ours was scheduled for May of 2020. So the world changed, right? And we didn't get over. But as soon as uh, King Charles went, uh, took the throne, we were there uh, actually a week after the coronation. And so we met with him this past May uh, and uh, had our meeting. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't, he stayed away from, uh, I shouldn't say he stayed away from kind of those kind of personal comments or, or uh, questions. But more generally, he talked about his appreciation for uh, Indigenous people and particularly around treaties. You know, he uh, is very well schooled in terms of treaties, what they mean, the history, obviously. I mean, his, uh, his grandmother, right, was uh, Queen Victoria at the time the, the treaties were signed. And so he, he very much is aware of of that connection you know through his generations but also through ours so uh, very interested in that regard yeah hello yeah. hey my name is ryan by the way you two are a cute couple by the way i just want to say that <laughs> start off uh, i guess my question is uh for you who are you guys <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh yeah, yeah, I guess I have two questions for you. That first question is to piggyback off the last one. As an Indigenous person meeting King Charles, did you talk about any money or land back or anything like that? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, my real question is, uh, looking at the trajectory of your career, uh, you know, growing up like with your language and stuff like that, and going on to RCMP, then the current job you have, looking at that, and then you look at the Indigenous person who has been in and out of prison, develops addictions, and sometimes leave us, leaves this world at a very young age. In uh, your view, I just want to hear your thoughts. What's the difference between you and that Indigenous person? 
Well, first of all, I'll say that that hurts me. Not your comment, but when I see that, right? Because I guess at my stage in life, I very much appreciate, uh, not all the time, but why people go down different paths. And for me, what was different? You know, uh, my grandparents, you know, I never hesitate giving them credit for, for who I am. My mother, who was a hard worker, she was a housekeeper. She worked in hotels and, and uh, fishing camps uh, where she cleaned, you know, cabins, and, uh, but worked very hard at it. And we, you know, we learn by watching, right? I, I was never lectured about working hard. It was watching those around me or close to me doing what they had to do to survive. Uh, my grandparents, as I described, being so close to the land, living literally off the land and each and every day. And those are the things that by watching, I appreciated later on that those were the things that influenced my behavior and how I applied myself to different roles or work and responsibilities. The other thing is, and sometimes a sensitive topic, but there was no alcohol allowed in my house. My grandparents never touched alcohol. It was all around us on the reserve, absolutely. And we saw the effects of that, the impact, impacts, but not in my house. And that was just, they wouldn't allow it. Right? And so again, watching that, hearing that, them taking a stand with that, so that it wouldn't affect not only them, but us too as their grandchildren uh, was an important factor. And so, and then that encouragement to, to finish school. And there were rules, but many times unsaid, again, it was more behavior, right? You know, the lights were out in our house, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at the latest at night. And in the meantime, you'd hear the noise around. And so those are, and people say, well, I mean, that's, how could that influence you in terms of your lifelong journey? Well, absolutely did. Uh, those factors, you know, that, that living in that household, the, the work ethic I developed, uh, the respect for people and uh, relationship building, recognizing that you can't do this alone. You have to appreciate those around you as your journey progresses that have supported you. And they were the foundation for me. And then in school were teachers and and so on and on in the forest were colleagues and senior officers that encouraged me and eventually got to where I did. But at the end of the day too though, you have to find it within yourself. I talked about a bit of an epiphany around the realization that I could do whatever job was put in front of me. When I say job, I use that, you know, to cover off school or the jobs that I had between high school gr uh, grades and uh, the force and just really applying oneself and and uh, through that getting the recognition but uh, finding that inner strength and believing in yourself you know there's sometimes I I don't know you know other reasons because people have asked me that's a very common question well how come you're here and you know others have gone down a different path I've got cousins of first cousins brothers really that i grew up with in the same household that went down different paths and so uh, part of that answer i have to say i don't know but uh, i think collectively you know, those different reasons that I've laid out help me, you know, get to where I am here today in, in, in this particular position. Sinos? Get the mic behind you there. 
One, two. Um, go ahead. I'll go after you. Or it's going to be real long. <laughs> long? <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sinos, and I'm really pleased to be here and listening to your story. Your story can relate to my own coming from a country, third world country, and where we don't have a running water, we don't have light in our house, walking to school 10 to 15 kilometers away, I can relate when you're narrating your story and see where you are. I'm very, very honored to, to, to see where you are in this position. Um, <clears throat> I have a, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you spoke about um, how you work hard and evolve to be where you are today. And obviously you kind of being very diplomatic in speaking your experience in the force and getting where you are. Being connected to a lot of indigenous friends and who work in different um, institutions who experience uh, the systemic uh, racism in workplace, um, being a person of color who can relate into that, obviously getting to where you are, it was not just only simply because you work hard, but obviously have a big card to, to, to see where you want it to be. My question here is that what, if you can think of something, what is the one challenge that you met during your work time and you are able to overcome and stay in that workplace which is more dominant, um, wide dominant institutions and actually enable you to progress to where you are. What was the challenge and how do you manage it to stay on to get to you? My next question would be um, also um, your appointment is a non-political appointment and which um, we can understand, but my question is around the system right now that is so much that the indigenous people being policies that are not really um, very discriminatory policies, right? Uh, and we can talk about the resource sharing, we can talk about all these things. So as you are right in your position, what do you think we as a province, as a people moving forward to recognizing that we all have the rights to live the way the creator creates us to share the world that we can share? What is your take on that as an advice of all of us? Thank you. So the first question around a particular challenge in overcoming that, I don't think I can pinpoint one particular situation or challenge because particularly, I mean, it went from school into the RCMP because as much as I say and describe LaRange being kind of an integrated community or communities, there was racism racism exists there today and so that was constant within the rcmp same thing right and so again i think it's stepping back into oneself myself and saying this is unacceptable but what can i do as an individual i mean i can't change the world but i have a voice right and where appropriate, depending on the circumstance or the situation, I expressed it. And, and I think I alluded to being non, non-confrontational because I always felt, and again, I think that was based on how my grandparents behaved and how they dealt with situations, that I learned that 
there are different ways of dealing with, uh, use the word conflict, where people might disagree or people are racist or say something that is inappropriate. And so I always took the approach that, how do I change this person's attitude? You know, I can't change the world, but if I can get this person or this group of people these, uh, to think a little bit differently about me individually, but my people, if I can use that term, I hesitate to use that term, but Indigenous people more broadly, then I think I've done my part as an individual, right? And so that's kind of the foundation that I built on as I progressed through the RCMP and demonstrated through my actions and my words that what people thought the stereotypes was and is wrong, right? You know, I'm proven right to this very day. I mean, I look back and I talked about being in university, not knowing whether or how many other indiv uh, Indigenous people were at the University of Saskatchewan. The number pops into my head that there were, I think, about 11,000 students back then. Um, maybe, I, I have no idea, I can't even guess, because we didn't have centers where we could come together and have uh, the supports that exist today. And uh, so I see now today, though, and and Donna talked about her family, and I know Cumberland House is an amazing community when you look at the number of people that have gone on to post-secondary education and uh, undergraduate degrees to masters to doctorates for such a small community and all Indigenous people. So it's through that type of um, change that I think the rest of the world will look and say, yeah, you know, we're all the same, we're all equal. They're, they, they're not less than, it's not that they can't do or can't be what was traditionally thought differently about. And uh, anyway, going off on a bit of a tangent there, but point being that the world has changed. And I think the more that we see and accept that indigenous people can be a part of this world, the better off we'll all be. And uh, it's about opportunities, it's about recognizing, it's about opening your eyes to, to those around you. And, you know, I didn't get into that as far as Donna and I living across the country and diff live different communities. We, even to this day, we talk about, wasn't Newfoundland such an amazing country? They worked hard, they, they, they came over from, from uh, the United Kingdom they're fishermen or fishers now, use the term, and they lived a hard life. And so we learned to appreciate in each region, every community they went to, what people brought to that community and how they uh, contributed in a very positive way. And I think the point there I'm trying to make is we all need to open our eyes, including people that, that may think negatively of others, that no, we, we all belong here. I think you said it at the end of your comments there in terms of, you know, the creator putting us here as equals. And we are, right? And it's just taken us, not so much it's taken us a long time to, to prove that we're equal to anybody else, but to get people to look at us through that same lens. And so, uh, yeah, it was, a gradual kind of thing for me it wasn't one particular kind of challenge. Uh, within the RCMP, there was certainly a sense that that Indigenous people couldn't contribute at the same level. But so individually, I, again, it was my mind, I'm going to prove them wrong because I can do any job within the force. And I always believed that and I still believe that today. When we started looking at in Saskatchewan, particularly how to recruit more indigenous people, we came up with this concept that, well, we'll recruit people from Saskatchewan to stay in Saskatchewan. Uh, a full class as it's called, or troop, that's the terminology within the RCMP. So when I talk about my troop, there were 32 of us 
from every province across Canada. That wasn't working for us because finally, and I say that, the organization recognized that we do need more Indigenous people within the RCMP. And so we took on this challenge of recruiting a full class to stay in Saskatchewan, recruited in Saskatchewan to stay in Saskatchewan. The most resistance we, re we received from that idea, that concept, was from within the force. You know, reasons like, well, it's not fair to the other provinces to do that. Uh, you know, 32 Indigenous people going there will feel uh, different because, you know, they're there as a group and everybody else is in kind of mixed uh, groups or, or troops. And and we argued against those those ideas or those notions. And anyway, long story short, at the end of it, it was very successful. We had one, then we had a second troop, and then eventually a third troop. And the impact of that across Saskatchewan, but across Canada, was tremendous. All of a sudden, other provinces were saying, hey, we want to do that too. So that's an example of where you take a challenge where maybe Indigenous people weren't uh, recognized or, to be able to contribute in a significant manner to the organization, we proved otherwise. But it took time, it took hard work, and it took getting over the long established ideas within the RCMP that you know something, a different approach wouldn't work. I'll leave it there. I mean, I, we could discuss that uh, at length, but the second part of your question about this role and being non-political. So just to set the stage, it is a, a federal appointment. It's an appointment by the governor general on the advice of the prime minister. It's totally nonpartisan, non-political in the sense that it's not a political position, non-partisan position. People still misunderstand or don't understand because people have asked me if I work for Premier Mo. I said, no, I don't work for Premier Mo. I work for, and I, I don't work for, well, I do. I do work for the people of Saskatchewan, but I help government do its job. That's the simplest way that I can describe my role. And so when they make decisions, though, I'm not, I don't have the legal authority if they follow due process, meaning government process, meaning as laid out in the constitution of our country, then there's no way I can say stop that. I don't agree with that policy or that legislation. Like it's beyond my authority to do that. The Lieutenant Governor position in history has been called as well or described as a constitutional fire extinguisher. So what that means is that it would have to be a constitutional uh, challenge or issue where provinces or governments have stepped beyond their authorities to do something that potentially a lieutenant governor could step in and say, hang on here and, and be kind of a referee, a constitutional uh, referee. Now, I wouldn't do that on my own because I'm not legally trained, but I have access to legal scholars and people who have that experience to, to provide me with advice, if it ever came to that. It never has, close, because ultimately, uh, lieutenant governors have to let governments do their job. There's one example in recent history in British Columbia that's often used when we talk amongst ourselves, because we talk about different situations uh, that have arisen that maybe you start to look at and uh, in my time none of them even come close so in british columbia quite a number of years ago it's public so i can say it the premier bill van der Zem was a pre premier and there was a situation there were had to do with contracts and his interests in a in a theme park and 
he claimed publicly that he had absolutely no interest in that theme park, yet it was being considered for government contracts. And at the end of the day, it was shown that he, in fact, was behind the scenes still uh, making decisions on behalf of, of this company or with the company. And so when challenged on that, he resigned. And later on, after the election, the sitting Lieutenant Governor was asked, if he hadn't resigned, would you have stepped in to resolve the situation, whatever that might mean? And he said, yes, I would have. So when people talk about the Lieutenant Governor just stepping into any situation where there's disagreement about something, that, that just doesn't happen. It has to be based on clear uh, legal uh, issues or or challenges and uh, or in this case was a obvious conflict of interest where uh, the person was trying to hide his involvement in a situation yeah so one more question <clears throat> last one uh, some you know yeah get the dumb scott no i am egg watcher kaki Wa bum tan a big square nanto, a baker square to mana, a ne yawing. A gua kicks marks and I know my a much one itaya. Moigunesque quire, Camache, Queacamim one, and to talk a gay tear. Nistamine quay big square and quick snow market and draw some sake conusimis. A gua kaki. Scrama swan, Nistamina no go make your picky head take wire. Moyachi a car simon. I'm going a cock tap monkey cook monia sucker. Emma met to a chick a car simo chick. Don't set the girl kick. I to a chick. I date the man. That grand auto Nian and Nicky Tato Ponyan Kamache. Skateman tanse I to echik. Egwa teko echim to koko maya. Kisto chik si se tan kakik snow maso ekekte cheki machik stuta mek. I sume peki chita mano maya. Kapeta kapeta tane ne yawe ne. Peki chita manista. Egwa maka kwechim tan. Kwechim to kok. Pierrun to him, Anima. Donna Manama at some more. The guy who sagged that same would more in time instigate. You go Pierrun this nun with a gagit to answer in the Mosom or no Mosom pan no home pan mother sagged that same work. Mother Pierre sagged that same one of six kiddistam. Capin neither we won't pull. You go Patoska much time is chicken. Gospigagi, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't live here, I said in English. So uh, just to quickly summarize, 
out of respect for everybody here that doesn't speak the language, he's talking about his learning the English language and not knowing it until he started school. He too, having been raised by his grandmother and asking if that was kind of our same pathway in terms of learning the English language. And it is basically, but I inserted in there that I didn't share before. I have shared it publicly. When I was four years old, I contracted tuberculosis and I was sent to Fort San by Fort Capel for treatment. And I was there for about a year, just under a year, and where I learned some English. And so when the nurse took me back to uh, my home in La Ronge, stepped out of the car, and my grandmother and mother had met me, were there, obviously. And I stepped out and said in English, this is not my home. And of course, my mother and people were upset that, that I would say such a thing, and I was crying. And, and it was my grandmother that was a steady influence. She stepped in and said, oh, no, no, it's OK, it's OK. And you know, he'll, he'll get over it soon enough. And of course, you know, at four or five years old, you, your memory's short, right? And uh, but so my journey was a little bit different. But Donna talked about hers. And, and uh, if you want to share a little bit more. I, I grew up with them. Um, my my parents both talked uh, Cree and English, but when we were at home, we spoke Cree, and I played with my cousins, and we all played together in uh, spoke Cree when we were playing outside. But when I went to school, I think it was probably grade three. I had a nun who was a my teacher, and she told us, no, you're not allowed to talk Cree in the playground. I want you to learn English properly. And of course, we're playing outside. Like These are my, my um, cousins that I was playing with. As soon as the supervisor or the teacher went around the corner, what did we do? We spoke Cree. <laughs> and I said, I didn't listen to sister. And I'm so glad I didn't, because I was able to, to keep my Cree language. Does that answer? Question? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Before we go uh, very quickly, because I, I didn't uh, fully answer the question when we regard to this role in Indigenous people. And I think it's important that I put some context to those comments, but also how I th thought when I received that phone call and even today. So when I received the phone call from the, uh, the PCO, it's called Privy Council Office, which does all of that work for, on behalf of the PMO, the Prime Minister's Office, selecting people or identifying people for different positions. I received the call and and uh, I got off the phone and Donna was there and he said, you wouldn't believe it. They're asking if they would let my name, if I would let my name stand as a potential candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan. And so we had that discussion and included our, our two children and the pros and cons kind of discussion. But the one thing that was a stumbling block for me was, do I want to step into a position and continue to be an instrument of colonization? My words, my exact words at the time. And so we talked about that. And But it goes back to comments I made earlier about stepping into these difficult positions. Now, that's not to say that, you know, I do it without any thought of something else. I mean, we all have egos, and I thought, geez, that's a very prestigious position. That'd be kind of neat, right, to be Lieutenant Governor. But underlying that was, boy, you know, the, it, it was the Lieutenant Governors that re were really the heads of government across Canada before Confederation. They ruled, in fact, right? And 
and they implemented uh, the government policies that were being uh, talked about in in central Canada across the rest of the country. And then, of course, once Confederation came along, you know, they were still there. The Lieutenant Governor was the head of government out here in the, what was known as the Northwest Territories before the provincial boundaries were created in the West. And I thought, all the bad things that have happened to us and our people because of government policies and approaches and whatever else, yes, it's 150 years ago, but do I, do I really want to be a part of that? And so I put aside, you know, that the, uh, the ego and really looked at that very carefully. Yeah, but it also always came back to that point and talk, you know, the discussion within our family. I said, no, I think uh, it's time because I was the first Indigenous person in the province to, to be appointed to this role. Not the first in Canada. There were, I think, three others before me, Alberta, BC, and Ontario. And uh, so... It, uh, it took some thinking, but again, it's about the voice, right? So finally, when we decided it was, we're going to do this together, that was the first thing. And secondly, we're going to take part of who we are, whatever that means at that time, into this role. Uh, and it was symbolic gesture on our part, but when I was, uh, sworn into office or the uh, installation ceremony at the legislature, I wore my moccasins, as did Donna. Symbolic gesture, but for us, very meaningful and visible, right? There's a funny story leading up to that, but I won't get into it too much. It was about, well, what do I wear? Well, supposed to, the morning suit. Well, what's that? So it's a suit, but it it's a kind of styled on the old British uh, kind of, of suit where there's tails on the jacket, right? They extend down. And what about shoes? Well, you know, the guys usually wear, uh, you know, black, shiny shoes, which I was used to because of being in the force. Uh, but usually they're patent leather because they stay shiny. And um, I said, what, really? never you know any shoes that i have they're shiny because i've actually put polish on them but i said uh, to my principal secretary at the time I said what about moxins and she looked at me and said yeah why not so that's how that happened but in a more practical sense you know i meet with many many people across the province uh, government officials uh, educators uh, community leaders and uh, events like I did today, tonight, I start by giving a greeting in Cree. Uh, why? Because that's who I am, right? And I want people to know that. And I want people to know that Indigenous languages are still alive. Struggling? Absolutely. But if I didn't use my language to promote my language, I think I'd be doing a disservice not only to myself, but to uh, Indigenous people. And so it's through that, that notion of having a voice that I've applied to this role that I think, uh, well, not I think, I know, it's been different here in the province. Final story I'll share is, I had a fellow come to visit me shortly after I was appointed. He was taking pictures and wanted a, my picture in the office, wanted to have a discussion. I met him before, I didn't know him well, but I knew he was a Cree speaker. So we sat in my office, had a conversation in Cree. Midway through the conversation, I said, you know what? To my knowledge, this is the first time there's been a Cree conversation in this office, in a building that was built in 1891. And I think that's progress, so. I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thank you so much. I can't tell you enough how, how much we thank you for your coming t this evening. But we're going to put you to work in your role as a Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan. I want to ask uh, Agnes Desjardins to come up. If you can uh, Rob help her up. 
Um, I, me too. I, I wear different hats in the community here in Saskatoon. And, um, one of the hats I wear is I, I help men and women who are incarcerated in the regional psychiatric center, which is a federal penitentiary. And I've been helping out there since about 2015. And uh, this is where I met Coco Magnus, as we call her. Uh, she's been, she worked there since about 1995, helping men and women in that institution reconnect with their culture, reconnect with their ways. I uh, can't tell you how valuable she is, but she, uh, she retired a couple years ago. And um, she's so deserving of a, a Queen's Medal. So I figured, hey, the governor, the lieutenant governor is going to be here anyways. So um, I'd like you to, uh, everyone to meet uh, Coco Magnus. So was, uh, as part of my role as lieutenant governor, one of the greatest uh, joys that I have and Donna as well is uh, attending community events, but more importantly, recognizing people for how they've contributed not only to their community, but by extension, the entire province. And so last year during the Platinum Jubilee year, as they call it, 70 years on the throne before she passed, Queen Elizabeth II, this medal was struck in recognition of that 70 years of her time on the throne as our sovereign. And we traveled the entire province presenting all kinds of medals. There were 7,000 that were allocated for Saskatchewan, but not that we presented 7,000, but many, many of those that we did. And it was absolutely uh, a joy to do that because as we presented the medals, we heard about how people were contributing to their communities, the impact that they had on other people's lives around them in their communities, the work that they did, obviously, as the elder uh, was talked about in her work. And just amazing. It just reinforced how uh, tremendous the people of Saskatchewan in general are. But for me, you know, when we were able to present these, and especially tonight to Indigenous people, it really was very special for us as well. So tonight I'm honored to be able to present this medal uh, in recognition of the work that you've done and how you've helped people uh, along the way and obviously had a very positive impact. So, can I ask you to know that I'm going to ask you to ask you to ask you to ask I just want to give the mic, uh, introduce, this is Travis, uh, introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Travis Boone, I'm the warden of the Regional Psychiatric Centre. I have known Agnes for many years and uh, in my previous life at Learning and Development, Agnes gifted us uh, a blanket recognizing the work that we had done and uh, I'm here along with my colleague. Oh. Um, hello, I'm Audrey Hobman. I, uh, I have worked with Agnes for most of those years uh, out and about. And um, prior to her retirement, we worked for many years on the women's unit at the Regional Psychiatric Center. Uh, the thing about the work that it is that we do that isn't well understood is we have an opportunity every day to make a, a positive change in people's lives in big ways and in little ways. And I can tell you that uh, Agnes spent her, her time with corrections with the women and the men that she worked with uh, making changes every day. You know, we miss her, we love her, and uh, we're happy to be here tonight. So as is tradition in uh, Indigenous ways, uh, we offer uh, a blanket is offered to, to honour, and they're just going to drape it around her as part of uh, honouring her this evening. Many years telling me to behave. <laughs> so many, many years. Think of more. 
He's going to sing a, my cousin Alan Bonnet is going to sing a, an honor song for all our guests this evening, including um, Lieutenant Governor, their honors, and um, Mrs. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, as well as Coco Magnus. Um, so this is a, an honor song. Uh, in my traditions, um, the ones who are being honored are the ones who stand. So you, you can just remain seated because uh, they're the ones who are being honored. So I'll just get my cousin to, uh, he's going to sing, uh, sing number 48. <clears throat> one, two, one, two. Wakatanka to Kashelam Pela Maya Yellow Hea Wakatanchano Pa Maya Coelo Pela Maya Yellow Hea Hea We chose a new Maya Coelo Pela Maya Pela Maya Wakata chano pa maya kuelo Pela maya yalo haya haya We chose ani wa maya kuelo Pela maya yaya Pela maya yaya Hey, 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 hey. 